Okay, something we always talk about on this podcast, and rightfully so, is how complicated all these things are in any movie or any discussion or even any full history class trying to break down any topic is, you know, it's going to leave things out and it's just, it's just hard to ever break anything completely down. When I watched Lumumba here and then started doing the research, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this might be the most complicated situation of any film we've discussed on this timeline. Yes. And also, I, so I completely agree. And also, it was so hard to research this and find sources that were not biased or if they were to try and dig through the biases because of when you research a country that was like fighting for independence, doing this whole an- the anti-colonial thing. And then also the U.S. and the Soviet Union were involved at one point to include, you know, the CIA. It was so hard some people are like, oh, you know, Lumumba was an idiot, didn't know what he was doing. You know, he basically brought this all on himself. Some people are like, you know, Lumumba's a saint. He died for what he believed in. You got the the whole, you know, East versus West thing going on. It's yeah. This I, I think it I think it might take the cake for the most complicated story that we've discussed so far. And my take on it is that he was probably just a scapegoat ultimately. But I feel like even that is informed by the fact that he's the protagonist of the movie we just watched. So I don't right. know how how skewed that perspective is and how, how accurate that depiction is. But w- within the movie, I would say that's how they're framing it. That it was a right. chaotic time in the Congo and Lumumba was president for, what, three months? before two being months. Two months before being assassinated. And even that was just kind of part of being scapegoated for all all the problems. So let's let's uh let's backtrack here. The Congo is a little more so unlike Algeria last week, which is you know on the Mediterranean coast. The Congo is you know deeper in the quote unquote you know jungles of Africa. You know the typical kind of kind of thing you think of you know when you think of the Congo. So the Europeans were a little slower getting here, and in the 1800s, actually I forget the exact year here. But Belgium is who ends up controlling the Congo, but it initially starts when their, oh, their king, let me see if I can find the name of the king, is King, uh, king Leopold? King Leopold. II, right? Yep, because that's why, that's why the, yeah, that's why the town is called Leopoldville. Yeah, yes. But yes, yeah, King Leopold II, which I, I think they said it about in the beginning of the movie, um, they mentioned in the, the opening text uh, about the Berlin Conference in 1885. Yes, I was going to get to that too, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah which I guess was basically Otto von Bismarck and the rest of Europe kind of dividing up Africa amongst the Europeans, like who was going to control what portions of the country Correct. or of, of the continent. Yeah, basically, King Leopold got the Congo not necessarily as part of Belgium. Correct. It was like his own personal ranch, yes. essentially, like his yes. own personal territory. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't part of Belgium. It was like his personal property, but it was the Congo, which is... It's huge. It's, I think it's the second largest country. Second largest country, maybe the largest country in Africa. I, I wouldn't be surprised. So yes, in the 1870s, 1880s, it became King Leopold's personal property. And again, like you said, just his ranch. And then in 1908, it became the Belgian Congo, kind of a more of a Belgian colony and part of the country. Not to the extent, though, like Algeria was with France. Again, all this stuff is so complicated. But let's go back to the Berlin Conference. And the quote that I, well, it's not a quote, it's, I'm quoting Wikipedia, but I thought this, this sentence sums up so much, and it referring to the Berlin Conference of 1885. The conference ushered in a period of heightened colonial activity by European powers, which eliminated or overrode most existing forms of African autonomy and self-governance. So, like you said, it's kind of dividing it up, and it's very much in line with what we saw in Lawrence of Arabia talking about the Sykes-Picot Agreement dividing up the Middle East by the Europeans that actually happened 30 years earlier in Berlin, dividing up Africa in a similar way. And if you look at maps of Africa in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it's all owned by Europe. Like, and you even have, like, we even maybe right. we talked about French West Africa, because that's not even necessarily related to French Algeria. It was a different part of Africa. And France controlled almost half of Africa, and Britain controlled a huge swath. And it was just an absolute mess. And what, what a nice way to say that, heightened colonial activity. <laughs> like <laughs> right right raping africa for all its resources 
right for like a hundred years. I mean, and and arguably even I mean a lot of that stuff. Even if the European countries don't necessarily um, have control over those countries, I mean, they still speak English in South Africa. They still speak French in Algeria. I mean, even today. Well, in the Congo, I did the, the Congo is the largest French speaking country in the world. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. Belgium yep. speaks French is one of its uh, main languages. So, yes, yeah, so the Congo speaks yep. French and it's there's more French speakers in Congo than there are in France. Yeah. So before we get to the movie here still, the other thing I thought was interesting too. So part of what King Leopold had requested was kind of these explorations in the Congo. Because again, this is kind of the deep jungle. So in the Congo here, as part of the kind of the Belgian influence, this is where you get the whole famous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Because one... uh, David Livingston was basically an explorer and kind of the guy who was, you know, going through mapping, exploring, doing missionary work into the Congo and disappeared at one point. And so they send in uh, Henry Stanley to go look for him. He's also a journalist. So and then when he finally runs into him was another white guy there in the Congo. So he says, Dr. Livingston, I presume. And that's kind of the quote that I mean, it's still around today. We most. I mean, I had no idea where it was from, really. I mean, I kind of knew roughly it was this guy in Africa, but I, I didn't know the story. I would imagine there's probably a movie about that scenario, which actually, let me see. Um, We're supposed to know this, Rich. This is the. <laughs> this is getting cut out, Logan. We do know this. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so there ha- there has been uh, movies about Dr. Livingston and specifically, you know, Henry Stanley and, and David Livingston. And yeah, a few movies kind of over the years. Nothing that kind of that I even heard of, but there's definitely been movies kind of about their story. And the quote is something I'd heard all growing up. I and mean, she was probably, I mean, probably from Looney Tunes is where we all know it, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't, I don't even, I just know it from osmosis. No, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> from somewhere, I don't right. know. Right, well, it's t- it's, so it's tied into the history of the Congo. Okay, so... To the movie here, I tell you what, this is a really good movie. It's intense and you get frustrated. And so the framing device is, it's actually almost something like out of, oh, Goodfellas. Because the framing device is them, the is it, basically the execution of Lumumba is the bookend. So you kind of know at the beginning that he gets killed. And they kind of show him in a car, and he's talking about how basically like, even in death I'm a threat to them. And then they, sh- then right. they cut to them digging up some bodies and cutting them up and you know the yep. it's the white guys doing it but they're you know they're puking with the smell and they're, they got these big barrels that they're burning the body in and not to be all out of order here but we are often historically they weren't actually burned they were dissolved in uh sulfuric acid but mm-hmm. what we what we saw in the film is accurate where they're executed in the woods buried yep. then later dug up and chopped up and and the movie burned and it sounds like in real life dissolved in sulfuric acid Right. Because they, they consider Lumumba a threat. So, going back to the beginning of the story, which and then the movie does too, after this framing device, it, it flashes back, and we see Lumumba just kind of as an advocate for Congolese independence, because right. that's what's going on in Africa this time, like we dealt with last week. This is basically set just a little bit after the issue in Algeria that we, we saw in Battle of Algiers. Because he, he starts off as a businessman, and then I forget, he, he basically is, is interested in politics kind of the whole time. And then like when he makes enough money with the uh, the beer company, he then has enough money to actually campaign and get political office. Yeah, yeah, essentially. So basically he's from a, oh, I don't know if a wealthy background, but a well-educated background. So he was definitely, he definitely grew right. up well-educated, did have some runs with the law and stuff a bit, but just kind of a natural leader, essentially. He mm-hmm. helps found the, well, I'm not going to say it in French here, it's, it's the MNC, you know, the Mouvement National Congolais. So basically the, the Congolese nationalist movement of, you know, trying to, you know, right. independence. And they just slowly, I don't want to compare him to Hitler, but as far as the mechanics of the party's rise and influence, it's similar in a sense that it was kind of a smaller party that then gradually gets its message to build up and then ultimately they then get a lot more votes than anybody just a few years earlier would have thought so that's kind of the parallel i'm, I'm, right. I'm drawing there right no, right no parallels between their messages or right or their no, goals right, right or you know yeah just kind of the logistics yes, of their right. rise to power are similar right yeah he, and so like they even kind of show so so one side in congo here seems to be a little more just kind of like willing to play ball with the belgians 
and just kind of like, well, we'll still work within the context of them. And they even kind of seem like they, they reach a point where like, yep, this seems like the compromise that we're willing to make. But then Lumumba gives kind of a rousing speech of like, to hell with that. We want freedom and we right. deserve to be our own country. And that was when that's when the king of Belgium came to Congo, right? Probably, yeah. And then right afterwards, he, which I that was, I had that in my in my notes here. So it was June thirtieth, nineteen sixty. Basically, the king of Belgium came to the Congo. It was like after you know they had kind of made this like independence agreement, you know, for for Congo to leave Belgium and become its own country. But during the speech where the king was handing over power, he started talking about all of the things that and I'm doing air quotes here, all the things that Belgium did to help the Congo while, you know, it was under their rule. And Patrice Lumumba was like not having it. Right. You know, so you are our oppressor. Yeah, right. He wasn't even supposed to speak at that little conference that they had there. But he just got up and then made that speech about like, no, we are our own country. You have been oppressing us. You're not our saviors here, basically. And that was kind of like what catapulted him into being the prime minister for all of two months. Yes, yes. So, so well, yeah, all, all this is going down in 1960. Like we said, he only ends up being president for a few months. And yeah. it's basically the reason, again, we're, this is, I'm still saying, the most complicated thing we've ever had to d- dive into. So stay with us, but take it all with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, basically... This now movement gets enough support that they are able to establish themselves as independent from Belgium. And Belgium is fairly willing, seemingly or ostensibly, to work with them in that process of becoming independent. Yeah. But, and here's where I think the scapegoating starts to happen. Of course, this is complicated because you have so many different parties with a vested interest and immediately another part of the Congo declares separate independence and then Belgium who is pretending to help with Congolese independence supports the secession of this other part of the Congo and backs them against Lumumba's region to the point that they actually show uh, Lumumba flying in to like kind of meet with them because this is one of his basically states he's trying to get back and they basically say you can't land sir and they can't he has to fly back and then he later ends up under house arrest by another faction within his own party and they say oh it's just for your safety and you know there's at one point they basically it seems like a military that's like the end of, that's like the end of the story well right? i know but i mean i don't even know where to go with this yeah, like it's, right. it's just so right. it's yeah. just so yeah. it's just so muddied and so yeah you're right so within uh within his own country and even that i mean it's complicated because am i talking about just the region he remains control of I mean, you end up with multiple factions saying that they're in charge at the same time like it's just so so complicated so, but uh, one point worth mentioning is the military issue. So you have, after they declared yes. independence, the military has, still has these Belgian white officers in charge of it. The Belgians actually controlled a number of governmental organizations at that time because, and here's another crazy statistic for you, at the time that Patrice Lumumba became the prime minister of the Congo, there were 30, three, zero college graduates in the entire country uh what yeah (laughs) yes and and that's not a a dig on the congolese like no right it's 100 percent a result of the belgians opportunities afforded to them right right yes so because there was no one qualified to run a government in the country right the belgians said hey look we'll let you guys be your own country but for the next five years we're going to run all the important stuff, okay. including the military. Right. So that's why there were all the all the white Belgian officers still remained uh, in charge of their respective units, which then the, the military said, well, hey, wait a minute. I thought we were, we were our own country. We're still under the command of these white officers, though, because all, the military was still made up of Congolese, right. like native Congolese dudes. And so then they they mutinied. Right. And but yeah, started kidnapping officers, killing officers. Um, they took to the streets and started harassing, raping, pillaging, killing white people wherever they would find them. Right. Which now which that reflects poorly on Lumumba. Then, of course, Belgium was like, oh, well, now we're going to send our troops to the Congo to crush this mutiny because we can't rely on we can't use the Congolese military. You know, we have a duty to protect Belgians in the Congo. So right. then they sent the Belgian troops there and right. And they, and they basically blamed the Lumumba like, look, you wanted independence. And we, you know, this is, this is what you get. Right. 
but they weren't actually helping him. So basically, right. he had the, I don't want to say the right idea exactly, he had the right spirit of an idea, freedom and autonomy, and then the Belgians basically hamstrung him the whole time. Right. And then when the chaos ensues, he becomes the scapegoat when he was set up to fail from the beginning and basically had no chance. Yes. And I would say that's probably a fair statement, whether you love or hate the guy. Right. Which, and that does, again, agree or disagree with how he then handles Belgium sending their own troops to the Congo. Even if you don't agree with it, you can at least understand the desperation of this guy who, you know, basically his country's falling apart and the Belgians are making it look like it's, it's all his fault. Right. And then even half the Congolese, you know, end up turning against him as well. You know, whether it's a, se- yes. a separate state yep. or the military is still kind of grumbling. He does make a he seems to make what he thinks is the right decision when he, he fires the Belgian commander of the army. Mm-hmm. But again, then he's just losing control. And like you said, the army is basically then raping and pillaging. So he's got to get that under control. Right. And then, you know, there's him versus the prime minister, which I always get a little confused by that. Of course, France today has it that way. But the whole the, well, he, the he, president he was the prime minister was I thought he was versus the, the president oh okay i got it see even then i got him flipped yeah okay so basically it, of who actually has the you know the say ultimately and then yeah jumping ahead to where the military kind of arrests them both or puts them both under house arrest and they're like and they even have journalists even including like american journalists asking like is this a coup is this a coup and well, I don't know the exact quote, but the army commander says something is like, this is a peaceful resolution to the problem. Right. And it's like, is that code for military coup? Like, because yeah. <laughs> it kind of ultimately does end up being a military coup, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah no, no, no. Okay. 100%. Okay. It, it is a military coup by the end. Yeah. Okay. And then, so is it, is it all then the military who ultimately then holds him under house arrest and then captures him when he escapes? Is it? Yes. So okay. they, they actually leave out a lot of this stuff in the movie. Yeah. Um, they because they they're focused more on Lumumba, the guy versus the Congo crisis. As Fair. A whole. Yes. But basically, so when Belgium sends troops to the Congo to try and like w- what they describe as protecting Belgians, but basically trying to keep their thumb on, on Congo still Lumumba then reaches out to the u.s he actually traveled to yes, washington which the movie left out yes right and he tries to get the u.s to intervene to help him take back control of his country and kick the belgians out essentially but that trip is ultimately unsuccessful the u.s tells him they're, they're not going to intervene so then he sees no other option but to then ask the soviets for help right and the soviets are all too happy to help him out, which they actually, uh, at the time, the Soviet Union had an entire bureau that was like set up to help African countries kick Western European countries out of their own country so that they could then be like, hey, you know, we're the Soviets, we're the good guys, you know, we're, we're anti imperialists, you know, we're, we're going to come help you out. Did we mention this was complicated? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And and I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that Congo is one of two places in the world where you can mine cobalt. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that there's uranium deposits in the Congo or diamond mines. Right. And then, of course, getting Russian help ends up, you know, having people try to label Lumumba a communist when he's anything but. Right. And it's kind of funny. It's not funny. But so he goes to the U.S. He says, hey, can you help me out? And the U.S. says, uh, yeah, no, we're, you know, we're not going to get involved. They try to push him to the U.N. basically said, like, we, we'll, we will help, but only through the U.N. channels, not through us as an independent nation. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. So, well, eventually they just kind of tell him to pound. Or initially, they just kind of tell him to pound sand. Then he goes and says, hey, Soviet Union, U.S. isn't going to do anything for me. What can you do for me? And then the U.S. finds out about it because I so I watched okay. an interview with the uh, the guy who was the uh, CIA chief of station in Congo at the time. Mm. And uh, basically, he went to the U.S., they said no. Then he goes to the Soviets, and they say, sure, yeah, we'll help you out. And then the Americans find out about it, and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> Guys, I think we, this is a problem now. Yeah, so then the U.S., they initially were like, well, maybe we will you know, act unilaterally. Maybe we'll use NATO to kind of go in and help and, and kick the Soviets out, because we don't want the Soviets taking control of the Congo, because Again, economic reasons. Congo is one of two places in the world where you can mine cobalt, which is it's a metal that's essential for all kinds of construction, jet engines and and electronics and stuff. Uh, The other place in the world where you can mine cobalt is the Soviet Union. (laughs) 
So Congo is kind of important. Yeah. Okay. Right. So they were, yeah, they, they were considering, you know, unilateral option, NATO option. Eventually they said, well, we'll send in, we'll, we'll get the UN security council to send in peacekeepers. And so the UN sent in peacekeepers, but at the same time, the U S also had the CIA there and they were like, yo, get rid of this Lamuma guy. He is causing mm. way too many problems for us. And in this, the interview with this CIA chief of station, he said, well, you know, initially he was like, well, I, I, I don't want to just outright kill the guy. But he then kind of like, he, he had some plans and some schemes for how he was just going to get him out of power without killing him. But eventually what ha- what ended up happening was Lamumba put Joseph Mobutu named him as the commander of the army and uh, the army and by extension Mobutu, they were upset that Lumumba had basically taken away any power from the Congolese army and had given it to the Soviets. So then they went to the CIA and said, Hey, if we do a, a military coup and kick Lumumba out, you know, will we have the backing of the United States? And the CIA said, Oh yeah. Right, because Lumumba tied himself with the Soviets, which meant we had to ally ourselves with the other side, period. Right. Um, and actually, so the, the UN forces that were there helped the Congolese army put him on house arrest. And uh, I think they smuggled him out at one point. Like, he he tried to escape, but then he ended up getting caught by the army later and uh, had Lumumba executed. And, uh, and then, yeah, Joseph Mobutu was the president from, yeah, he was the, the president until 1997. Well, from 1965 until 1997. Oh, wow. And yeah, they're, they're kind of not, it sounds like they're not on great standing today. Like it's still a government that's full of corruption and definitely lots of issues, it sounds like, in the in the Congo. Yeah, it's, right. I, like I said, my notes here, I even just write, what a mess. Like it's... <laughs> yes. And I, I had seen like, I guess, pictures of Joseph Mobutu before somewhere. I'm not sure if it was in a history book or something. And I just it never really like... I, I never really registered who he was, but then at the end of the movie, when they showed him, the, they showed the actor mm. dressed as Mobutu, like giving a speech or something. It's like, oh, okay, he has a, a very iconic leopard skin yes, hat, yes, and he wears these like thick rimmed glasses. Yeah, and sitting on the little throne and kind so, of thing yeah. there. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I had seen pictures of him before, and I was like, hey, that looks kind of like the pictures that that guy that from history class from Africa or somewhere. Oh, right, and then it. Yeah. Generic African leader, uh, you know, semi despot. Yeah, right. it's this guy. And yeah, so after the assassination of Lumumba, like it actually led to protests around the world. It's a, they all kind of saw yeah. the injustice that had been done here. And, you know, in, in Europe, and even I saw like in New York City, there were like demonstrations that like were getting thousands of people in 1961 here after you know it was revealed that he had been killed because they, they initially tried to you know keep it quiet that they'd even killed him just try to disappear him quietly but you can only do that for so long before you kind of have to let it out that he's been been killed 1964 quote from malcolm x calling him the greatest black man who ever walked the african continent but it, but again we, we just we just don't know I mean, we're not we're not trying to say this guy was a saint or perfect the movie frames it that he's definitely the good guy. And again, it's hard not to read this and see him as just being scapegoated by various other interested parties, including the United States and the Soviet Union. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's also hard not to say it's like, man, I feel like we should have picked the other side. It's like, if if we had helped him, the Soviets probably would have just then lashed onto the other side, of course, because it was all just about being, you know, opposite each other. But you wonder how differently, how, yep. how differently is how different is the Congo today if, if we side with Lumumba instead? But then again, does it lead to this big 1960s Congolese war? Then we never go to Vietnam. Like you just never know what the repercussions could be on these, these minor little things that have repercussions to today. We always talk about it all being connected, and yeah, a guy I'd never heard of, a conflict I wasn't familiar with at all. Yeah, I feel like I learned a lot, but also realized I just know nothing about this part of the world in this time period. So, yeah, yeah good show. Good show. Very good movie. An, an additional tie-in to a, a past episode. I don't know if we mentioned it or not, but in the uh, Che Guevara episode, did we did we talk about how he went to Africa at one point? I think we casually mentioned it. Was it to the Congo? So that that was in the Congo. It wasn't, it wasn't part of this. Okay. It was actually after it was a few years after Lumumba was killed. There was a rebellion 
of uh, Lumumba supporters, it was called the Simba Rebellion. Hmm. And it was basically, yeah, Lumumba supporters trying to overthrow Joseph Kasavubu and Joseph Mobutu, trying to overthrow their government. It ultimately failed. Soviet Union backed the rebels because they were more pro-communist. And then, you know, the West backed the established government. Yeah. Within a span of five years, there's like two major conflicts in this one country, both of which are basically proxy wars for the, the West and then the Soviet Union. Wow. Yeah, so the the movie is a 81% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's uh, very worth watching. And actually, it was free on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, yep. yeah, you, you can watch it there. And I, I would I would recommend it. It's uh it's a little dark, but I mean, it's it's a good movie, a very good movie. It's, it's, it's just kind of an interesting look into this part of the world. So check it out. Okay, so tune in next week and season three of History and Film will come to an end and we will discuss the right stuff. 